forgot to push the button. <laughs> um, that helps. Good morning. What a beautiful day. It's so good to see you all. A couple of cars, I can't quite see who's in them. If you want, there's a couple spaces right up here if you'd rather uh, have a, uh, if you'd rather see what's going on. Maybe not though. <laughs> I've been told I have a voice, a uh, face for radio, so. <laughs> Maybe it's all for the best. Welcome to worship. Very excited to be with you this morning. Uh, as we gather today, I have a question for you. Have you ever misjudged someone? Do you remember the last time you misjudged someone? Why don't you share that with uh, somebody near you in your car, hopefully. If you're by yourself, you can just have a conversation with yourself. We learn how to do that now. Guess when you see somebody with a lot of tattoos, you might think like, oh, I don't want to talk to them or I'm scared of them. They might be really mean. Yeah. I think I misjudged Gar Gary the first time I met him. What has he got to offer us here at Team Glory? And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> All right. I think I misjudged. Well, misjudging you know, like is part of life. Sometimes we them. misjudge people because we stick think more of them than we ought and sometimes less. Barb just shared with me that sometimes you see somebody and by their appearance you decide something about them that you have no idea could be true or not. Well, in our gospel today, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, for the rest of the summer, in an attempt to try to get people excited about reading the Bible, I'm going to be preaching on your favorite Bible stories. So if you have a favorite Bible story or a passage that you would like, uh, you can email me 
or write it down and put it in the offering. Uh, and each week I'm going to choose a different one to preach on. And hopefully they're kind of fun stories and stories that maybe you've heard a, a lot. Would like to uh, hear one more time uh, this summer. So kind of keeping it light. And uh, hopefully, so today I got to choose the one that is one of my favorites. And so I chose the Adam and Eve in the garden with the snake story. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Let us join together in our call to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us and in your spirit lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we all have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace. In your words of justice and mercy, reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Before we read the gospel, it's good to know that this is one of the oldest stories we have in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we know roughly its age based on, in the original manuscripts we have, the word they use for God, the word Yahweh. And uh, so as a creation story, this one is maybe about 8,000 years old. Today's reading is from the third chapter of Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat it with your eye, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, that your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree which about, I, about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed be the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat on your face, you shall eat the bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man named his wife Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made garments for skin, of skins for the man and for his wife, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man 
man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth in the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the, at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a sword flaming and turning the guard, turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Here ends the message. So that's kind of a long scripture reading. It's the entire third chapter of Genesis, in case you want to go back and read it later. Let's recap. So we have God comes to Abraham. Uh, God comes to Adam, which did you know in Hebrew the word Adam, the name Adam, just means man. So God comes to Adam and says, "You can eat of any of the trees you want, except for the one in the center of the garden." And who thinks that becomes the one you really want to eat, right? So then, God says, you need someone to help you. You need a, a mate. And so he uh, puts Adam into a deep sleep, takes one of his ribs, and uh, fashions a woman for Adam. And this is why men are better at grilling, because they understand the cost of every rib. Thank you. <laughs> That's the whole reason I wanted to use this story. No, it's not. <laughs> so then a snake comes along. Now in our, over the years, we have reinterpreted this uh, snake to be the devil or to be Satan. But clearly, it is simply just a talking snake. And the snake comes and asks Eve, why don't you want to, uh, are you allowed to eat from any of these trees? And she said, well, we can eat from any of them except that one. Because if we do that, uh, we will certainly die. And the snake says, well, actually, if you eat from that tree, you'll kind of become like God in that you will know the difference between good and evil. And so she looked at the tree and it looked good. It looked pleasing to eat. And the side benefit was wisdom. And so she ate and she gave some to Adam to eat. And immediately it worked. They now could see that they were not very wise. And that they were naked. Now this, this is really my favorite part that we're coming into. The Lord God uh, in Hebrew, Yahweh comes into the garden and he's like, Adam, Eve, where are you? Not what we think about when we think about God at all, right? In fact, we have another creation story that was written uh, a few thousand years later and it balances this one. So the first creation story is the account is in Genesis 1 1 and it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth do you know how this second story begins in the beginning God created the earth and the heavens so they're meant to be two stories like two sides of the same coin one will tell you from a heavenly perspective about the creation and one will tell you from an earthly perspective about the creation and you don't have to pit them against each other you can sort of uh, live in the tension between the two in the first story God says let there be light and there is light God is all powerful and merely has to speak the words and creation happens in the second story, he's going, Adam, Eve, where are you? 
And then when he finds Adam and he sees the fig leaves, uh, he asks, did you eat from the tree? Like he doesn't know, right? It's a different perspective of God. It's a perspective that is very intimate. And over the course of Judeo-Christianity, we've kind of lost this understanding of God as intimate. We've changed it for a God who is all-powerful. It kind of suits us better somehow. So there's a couple things I like about this story. Um, one is, is that God is portrayed kind of like one of us. He's walking in the garden, right? And he's talking with Adam. If you go back a little bit uh, into the second chapter, it's still this author and this story, and he fashions Adam out of the dirt, like a kid playing, making mud pies. I love that imagery. Far different than the first story. The second thing I like about this story is what it, the message is about what it means to be God and what it means to be us. And both us and God have the ability now to judge. And we do a very poor job of judging. When Jesus came over and over and over again, he kept saying, uh, be careful how you judge others because that is how you will be judged. In one place in John's Gospel, he says, I did not come to judge the world, but to redeem the world. We see a different side. Unfortunately, in the Middle Ages, uh, the only understanding they had of God was the first creation story, a God who is all-powerful and one who judges. Our, our best metaphor from the Middle Ages forward has been God as the judge. When you die, you will go to the pearly gates and God will judge you. Surely you've heard that a lot. But what this story does is it kind of turns that upside down. Because God's judging and our judging is not the same. We look at the outward appearance. We look at what we know and we make judgments. Even though God told Adam that if you eat from this tree on that day, surely you will die. Well, Adam ate from the tree. Did Adam surely die? No. So God judged Adam not just based on what he had done, but he also factored in other factors like the fact that God had created Adam. And that maybe the task of not doing the one thing that you're not supposed to do is a little over his head. The good news is that that's how God looks at us. Less like a judge, more like a father. My theology and my creation story preference completely changed on the day that my daughter Hannah was born. As I held her in my arms, I thought there's never ever anything that could separate my love for her. This is absolutely amazing. This must be what it's like for God every single minute of every day. Seeing a newborn baby that God created and feeling the love that just overflows out into the world. I remember I was on a train on the way back from Mexico with a bunch of teenagers. We went down to, uh, to work at an orphanage and on our way back, there was a woman sitting with two kids, and these were the brattiest kids you could ever know. They were acting out, they were throwing things, they were loud, uh, they were mean, they were fighting, slapping each other, and they were bothering everybody. I mean, even the group of rowdy teenagers I took 
thought these kids were over the top. And I remember sitting there watching their mom doing absolutely nothing. Just kind of staring out the window, maybe pretending that these weren't really her kids. And then at one point I noticed that she was crying. One of the female chaperones on our trip went over and sat with her and asked her if she was okay. And we learned that they had gone to Mexico to try to find an experimental treatment for her husband's cancer. And it didn't work. And now she was overwhelmed with grief and her kids were not really the biggest thing on her mind. And so we organized a bunch of teenagers to help out with her kids and keep them busy. But we realized that sometimes we make judgments about people and we don't know the real story. I believe Jesus came to help us understand who God is. You've heard me say that a hundred times if you've heard me say it once. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, handed over, he took bread and he gave it to Peter, who would betray him, to Judas, who would hand him over, knowing full well what they were about to do, he also knew that they were children of God. And that God loved them and so did he. We sometimes sing at the end of our song, at the end of our service, let us love. And it, there's a, a part of the song that says that we should see everyone through God's eyes. It's exactly what this story is about. The good news is that God sees you. And God loves you. God doesn't just look at the things that you've done wrong or made mistakes, but looks deep into your bones and says, this one is mine. Amen. can stand on the inside as we confess our faith in our creed. I believe in God, the creator, 
whose love is the life force of the universe, who believes in us, trusts us, and empowers us, who lives in us and through us, and fills us with wonder. I believe in Jesus, God's own Son, who showed through his life the heart and character of God, who lived to raise up the lowly, loved those unloved, fed those who hungered, and healed those with sickness, who taught adults and laughed with children, who was crucified for speaking truth to power, who was raised by God to live forever, and who inspires us to truly live. I believe in God's Spirit, who brings the mystery of God into our hearts, who guides us through a familiar whisper of truth, who sparks our creative passions, who comes to all in the bread and wine, who gathers us into one family and sends us out to be the good news. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right as we gather today as the body of Christ that we remember the night in which Jesus was handed over, the night he was betrayed, the night where he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. 
And he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us join together now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's will. Amen. For our sending song today, we are going to sing an old favorite, This Little Light of Mine. Because Pastor Tim forgot his guitar. <laughs>